Coming up on today's edition of Airborne, AEA wraps a successful convention and trade show in Las Vegas. Velocity selects superior engines for its V twin. And the electric powered Evector EPOS takes flight. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. Well, usually what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but that was not the case with the recently concluded 56th annual AEA Convention and Trade Show. Nearly 1,500 avionics manufacturers, distributors, repair stations, and other general aviation professionals took part in the four-day event and then left Vegas armed with new product knowledge, networking, and training experience. Some of the highlights of the event included more than 25 new avionics products and systems introduced to the market. The unveiling of the first AEA avionics market report, which reflects the monetary size of general aviation avionics market, more than 100,000 in scholarships awarded to avionics and aviation maintenance students, and of course, live streaming across the internet on the AEA website of the AEA opening ceremonies, new product introductions, and live exhibit hall coverage, courtesy of the Aero News Network. The AEA convention is the preeminent venue dedicated solely to the general aviation avionics industry. In a news release, AEA President Paula Dirks said, quote, Despite continuing economic and regulatory challenges, this week in Vegas, AEA members shared what's working within their own environment and pledged to take back home with them the knowledge gained to help grow their businesses. Velocity Aircraft is now offering its builders the options of either the 160 horsepower XP320 engine or the 180 horsepower XP360 engine, both manufactured by Superior Air Parts. As the preferred engine on their newest kit aircraft, the twin engine Velocity V Twin. John Abraham, the chief pilot for Velocity Aircraft, explained the reasoning behind the choice, noting, quote, Like the design of the V Twin itself, we wanted to offer builders something new and different, while at the same time raising the bar for performance and safety. Superior's XP engines do that and at a price that is thousands below a comparable Lycoming engine. That's especially important when you are buying two of them for your V-Twin." An attractive feature of the XP engines is that they can run on either 100 low lead or 91 octane automotive gasoline, though Superior notes that XP engines are not approved for use with any auto fuels blended with ethanol or gasohol. Even so, Glenn Golden, Superior's Vice President for Sales and Marketing, says, quote, The lower cost of the auto fuel combined with the low fuel burn makes the XP-powered V-Twin arguably the most economical piston twin you can fly. Evactor's electric-powered LSA Sportstar EPOS made its first flight from the Kunavis Airport in Czech Republic on March 28. The aircraft was powered by Vector's factory pilot, Radak Suri. After taxi test, the aircraft took off for a short, approximately 10-minute flight. It landed successfully, and a second flight followed immediately afterwards. The total time that the aircraft flew, powered by an electric motor, reached about 30 minutes. The Sportstar EPOS is a derivative of the Sportstar RTC, and it represents the concept of two-seater sport aircraft of the near future. The experimental operation of the Sportstar EPOS was made possible due to close cooperation between a vector and the Czech Light Aircraft Association. The first Sportstar EPOS presentation to the public will take place at Aero Friedrichshafen in Germany which will be held April 24th through the 27th. Bertrand Picard and André Borschberg, the Swiss pilots who founded Solar Impulse, announced Thursday that their solar-powered airplane will attempt a coast-to-coast -coast crossing of the U.S. this spring without using a single drop of fuel. 
It will be the first time that an airplane capable of flying 24 hours non-stop, day and night, and powered exclusively by solar energy, will fly across America. Solar Impulse will leave in early May from San Francisco and stop in four U.S. cities, including Phoenix, Dallas-Fort Worth, and Washington, D.C., before reaching its final destination of New York's JFK Airport in early July. Solar Impulse wants to inspire and motivate as many people as possible throughout its journey across America. In order to give everyone the possibility to be a part of the adventure, Solar Impulse will organize conferences and events on educational themes in the various stopover cities where the airplane will be showcased. All the flights and most conferences will be live-streamed on the Solar Impulse website. The flight across the U.S. will be the last mission for Solar Impulse before attempting a zero-fuel, round-the-world flight in 2015. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop us an email to news by at aero news.net. The FAA has rejected a request by Patient Airlift Services, or PALS, a nonprofit volunteer pilot organization, to use a donated aircraft to provide free air transportation for patients requiring medical care or other humanitarian purposes. PALS asked that it be exempt from Parts 119 and 135 of the FAA's regulations to allow it to use a Beechcraft Bonanza aircraft, which had been donated to PALS for its humanitarian flights. Since these regulations pertain mostly to air carriers, charter services, and commercial operators, and PAL provides its service at no cost to the patient by volunteer pilots who are not paid for their service, PALS thought it had a valid and compelling reason for the exemption. Joe Howley, PALS president, said that while they were disappointed, they understood the FAA's ruling because, quote, it would significantly alter our role of coordinating patients' travel needs with volunteer pilots to one in which PALS becomes an aircraft operator. It brings into question who will ultimately be responsible for the aircraft's operation, its compliance with maintenance regulations, insurance, and guaranteed safety to the flying public." End quote. Put another notch in the sequestration gun handle, as the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force announced that its presidential and research and development galleries will close until further notice, beginning May 1, 2013, as part of budget reduction requirements due to sequestration. According to Museum Director Lt. Gen. Jack Hudson, museum leadership had been working with the Air Force to comply with Department of Defense sequestration guidance to determine the best possible course of action for reducing museum operational and maintenance costs with the least impact to the public. Quote, this was not an easy decision, as we have several popular exhibits in the presidential and R&D galleries, including President Kennedy's Air Force One and the XB-70 Valkyrie, Hudson said. Our goal had been to make every effort to maintain museum operations to the maximum extent possible, and we hope to reopen these galleries as soon as possible. End quote. The main museum complex will remain open to visitors from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. seven days a week. 
The Air Force will fund utility costs for six days each week, and the Air Force Museum Foundation will fund those costs one day per week from May through September. Additional sequestration impacts include the weekly behind-the-scene tours of the museum's restoration area, which will end after the April 26 tour until further notice, as well as cancellation of the Wings and Things guest lectures on April 30th and May 22nd, and all summer aerospace camps. The owner of a Zodiac 601XL airplane was fatally injured after being ejected from the aircraft during a lesson. Authorities said neither person on board the airplane was wearing a seat belt at the time of the incident. The flight originated at Collegedale Municipal Airport near Chattanooga, Tennessee. An unspecified malfunction reportedly caused the airplane to suddenly pitch over during the flight at about 2,500 feet. The Chattanooga Times Free Press reports that the canopy of the airplane flew open and the student owner of the airplane was thrown from the aircraft. The instructor was able to land the plane safely. Neither person has been identified by the authorities, but the television station reports that the owner of the Zodiac was an experienced pilot who had recently purchased the aircraft and wanted more training. Earlier in the show, we reported on the first successful test flight of the Electric Evector EPOS. For those who would like more, here in today's Aero Video of the Week is part of that test flight caught on video. We told you the initial test flight was only 10 minutes, and this video is even shorter, just a quick minute and a half. Find it on YouTube by searching Sports Star EPOS First Flight. If you think taking your shoes off in public to clear security is at all embarrassing, just wait till you hear this. Imagine having to step onto a set of scales to be weighed in public before boarding your flight. Samoa Air has become the world's first airline to charge passengers by the pound, meaning heavier fares pay more than their slimmer counterparts. On the front page of the airline's website is a message, We at Samoa Air are keeping airfares fair by charging our passengers only for what they weigh. You are the master of your airfare. You decide how much or little your ticket will cost. No more exorbitant excess baggage fees or being charged for baggage you may not carry. Your weight plus your baggage items is what you pay for. Simple. Passengers flying on the airline are weighed at the airport and charged based on their overall weight, including luggage, according to a report appearing in the International Business Times. Samoa Air's CEO, Chris Langton, told Australia's ABC Radio that, quote, this is the fairest way of traveling. The prices range from a dollar per kilo on short domestic routes to four dollars and sixteen cents per kilogram on longer haul flights. Those longer flights would only be to neighboring American Samoa. The airline flies only two aircraft, a Norman BN2A Islander Twin and a Cessna 172. Families traveling on the airline seem to be appreciative of the fact that their children are charged much less for a seat than they would be under a more traditional fare system. Langton said the formula is simple, and as more people become more overweight, he thinks other airliners may follow suit and charge by the pound. Well, get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And join us again next Tuesday for another edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.